Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to give it a minute or uh, 30 more seconds to um, allow time for some late joiners to arrive and then we'll get going. Um, Eilat or Craig, could you just give me a thumbs up to say we're good? You can hear me okay? Perfect. Nice. Okay, so I'm just going to change the focus so we can say hello. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I hope you're uh, having a great day. Great. Hi, guys. Welcome. Welcome to this uh, webinar. This um, uh, this is going to be a speedy and hopefully um, thorough walkthrough on the functionality of the Air platform. So much has changed over the last um, 18 months or so that we felt it was time to start giving you some uh, regular updates in this in this form so that you can keep uh, keep up to date with where we are. Joining me today um, in the background or um, certainly there to help you guys is Ailet and Craig. Give us a wave, guys. They will, um, and I'm sure you've probably met both of them already, um, but they're there to deal with any questions you may have that you can just throw into the chat quickly um, and efficiently, and then we can discuss them. It's a fairly small group today, so uh, let's try and make this as interactive as possible because I don't want you to sit on your question till we get to the end because, um, you know, we may have moved on several subjects before we get to that point. So let's have those questions as we go through. And then that gives us an idea of the kind of uh, areas you want to focus on as users. Tim so, just mentioned they have a chat window that they can use, and Islet and I will be monitoring that to answer questions, unless, uh, of, of course, we wish to stop um, the presentation and elaborate on that a little bit more. We can certainly do that. Perfect. Thanks, Craig. Yes, so fire your questions in there. Um, just a couple of slides to start off. Originally, I wasn't going to bother with any slides, but just to sort of set, set the scene, as it were, put us put us in a, a position where we can launch into what we're going to talk about. I'm just going to remind you of um, where we see Air positioned um, as, a, as a player in this uh, cybersecurity, uh, cyber investigation field. And as you can see in this particular um, diagram, Air sits up there in the top right-hand corner because we think, um, or we know, that Air offers you really good forensic visibility and a really good detailed investigation capability. We are not seeking to replace EDRs or XDRs or even SIEM solutions. Uh, we complement those solutions, and in fact, we actually work alongside them and integrate with many of them um, for automation purposes. So. If your EDR has a, um, an alert, AIR will, can automatically be called into action to respond to that um, particular alert, alert in, in a way that you've already predetermined with, a, with an acquisition profile, for instance. So we're not seeking to replace those. Um, and finally, the other slide I just wanted to touch on briefly, just as a refresher, because I'm sure you're already looking at and working in these type of environments right now. This is the, a, a common setup. This is what we call a two-tier architecture. Uh, you can see over here on the right, oh, sorry, left-hand side, this is my representation for the web console. So this is what we're going to be logging into in a minute and looking at um, how we can drive our um, air across the network, across our, our estate. In, my, in this particular case, we've split the database away. So we have air on a, a second, uh, we have the database on a secondary server here. And out here in the field, you can see that we've got a couple of regions, region one, region two, where we have um, a variety of devices. Um, and as you know, we support Mac, Linux, um, Windows, of course, um, IBM AIX systems. 
Chrome, ESXi, etc. So plenty of coverage for what we can um, uh, we can cover out there in the field. And then there are two. This is a, uh, something that's really worth remembering. There are two ways in which people handle their evidence. We have a variety of customers, and they tend to use one of two different methods. The first being keep the evidence that we've acquired locally. So storing it on these uh, assets in the in region one or region two. This is beneficial because it obviously minimizes the data transfer and it speeds up um, our work because all of the processing um, is going on on the assets themselves and not being pulled back to a huge data center for centralized processing, which is, of course, what we see with uh, many other forensic solutions. However, because the demand is such, we all also offer the ability to send that evidence off to evidence repositories. So after collection and after post collection analysis, the, um, the collected evidence can be sent direct to one of these evidence repositories. So FS, FTPS, SFTP, SNB, S3 buckets and Azure. So this, this sort of sets the scene. So uh, we as an analyst uh, are down here in the middle where my mouse is sort of rotating right now. Uh, as an analyst, an examiner, a manager, uh, the CISO, he or she can access the server from wherever they are. It's a web-based um, application. So you can come into the application and you can manage or work the console from, from where, wherever you are. So it's truly collaborative. So with the scene set, let's um, see if we can work this system, change that to there. And hopefully, yes, I think you can see my, my dashboard. Um, so let's set the scene here again before we get go thundering off into this. This What you're looking at right now is the Air dashboard. Um, as all of you are existing customers, I'm sure you're familiar with it by now. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the particular organization is this one up here in the top right-hand corner called Compromised Org. Um, and I'm quite sure that several of you who've been involved in onboarding uh, sessions already would have, would have come across this particular organization. The multi-tenanted nature of the platform means that we can change the organization. So we can change the focus of our investigation by simply clicking on the link here. And you can see here I have a, a, a button for going to change organizations. And here's a list of all of the organizations that are available to me in this particular console installation. So you can see over time, um, this has been our primary demo environment for a while now. Over time, there's quite a large number of uh, organizations that I can um, use my console to work on. And you can see that the one that we're actually working on at the moment is this number 176 called Compromised Organization. So, we now know that we've got compromised organizations selected. So this is where our focus, where our focus is for this particular investigation or this particular incident. Several things changed with the dashboard over recent times. And um, some of you may remember when the main menu didn't look quite like this. But what we have over, over here on the left hand side is uh, the dark blue bar. And we call this the main menu. Occasionally, when you um, hit one of the buttons here, a secondary menu will open up. For instance, if I hit assets, you can now see there's a secondary menu here, which is listing all of the assets. But let's concentrate on, on the dashboard for, for now um, and just highlight a couple of other things that have changed and evolved over time. The global search bar is still here. So at the top of the whole of the console page here, you can see a, a global search bar. So this will search for anything that's in this particular organization's console. So anything, um, anything that's been recorded against this organization in the console, you can search for it in this global search option. As you come over to the top right hand side, we've got recents. Again, this is something that's evolved over time due to customer requests and um, to try and make your um, use even more efficient than it is already, we've given you all of these recents. So you can actually go and look at what recent assets have I been dealing with? What recent cases have I been dealing with? And the reason I keep saying I've been dealing with is as you can see at the moment, I have this filter saying only me here. So when you see that, I could actually change this and perhaps go and look at which, um, which recent cases ALS has been working in. So this is even more useful from a management point of view when you 
perhaps one of your employees in the SOC has go, goes sick um, and you need to see what they're working on, you can come and have a look at their recent cases or the recent assets and tasks or reports that they've been working on. So all of those are, are covered there. And for a larger, a bigger view of it all, if you click view all, uh, you'll get the whole um, list shown um, in, a, in a much uh, a single pane here. So that's recent. The other thing that uh, came in ooh, four or five, six versions ago now is the quick start button up here, which is super handy. This is a permanent fixture in this location on the screen. So whenever you, wherever you are in the console, if something breaks and you need to do something quickly, up here just next to the, the notifications, uh, which you can see I never read because it's over 100, um, but you can see the quick start button. And this gives me the ability to click here and dive straight into some of these primary functions of the console, such as acquiring evidence, taking a disk or volume image, running a quick triage, for instance. This could be a good place to come and launch one of those very quickly, or indeed adding a new case or adding a new asset to the, uh, to the console. I'm not gonna dwell on the information actually shown in the main window here, because we've, we've covered that before with you, I'm sure but you can see that these widgets have evolved also and more work goes on with these to um, make them more uh, useful and potentially making them user editable at some point in the future. The one area that I do tend to, we spend a bit of time is over here with asset summary because over here we get that summary of what is going on with all of our assets right now. Um, and this can be quite useful as a quick overview you, get a, you can get to see how many of your assets are currently isolated um, and how many are actually off network or how many are unmanaged at the moment. So this may be information that you want to act on um, immediately to put right. So that's quite useful to have that highlighted on, on the dashboard. So I'm not gonna go through every, what we traditionally would do is potentially go through every single button down here on the left-hand side and then um, drill into some of the features and functionalities. Rather than do that, I thought we'd just take this as though we were doing an investigation, a step through on how we would actually use this in anger. So for instance, the first thing I might want to be able to, to do is come and look at the assets themselves, have a quick look at what I've got, what is the nature of my assets and the breakdown of them. So in the secondary menu here, I can see that I have 24 assets in total, 14 of those are computers, and three are disk images. So this is probably something that's very new as well. Um, and we will be talking more about that in a short while. But um, since a release or two releases ago, we've given you the ability to explore disk images. So where you have a, a DD or a raw image available, you can bring that in as a, as a case, uh, sorry, as an asset, a new asset. So um, you can have real disk images, you can have off network, assets, you can have um, uh, disk images from machines that were have perhaps never been on a network, but you've taken that raw disk image and you can bring it in for analysis within, within air. Then we break it down further with these filters here showing that we've got three of our assets are actually based in Amazon Azure, at uh, Microsoft Azure and three in S3 or Amazon AWS. Um, tags, I'm sure, uh, we have touched on tags before. Tags are super important because tags can be applied in two ways. Uh, manually, so when you're working a case and you come across uh, an asset that is um, of note or importance to you, you can carry out manual tagging or you can do auto asset tagging. Um, so how, would, how does that work? Well, the very first thing that the responder does when it's placed on an asset um, is it scans that asset and it looks to see if any conditions uh, exist that mean that we can tag it and mark it as something. So let's take a quick look at that while we're talking about it rather than staring at a static screen. So if we go to libraries, this is where a lot of our rules um, and uh, useful things such as acquisition profiles, triage rules, our interact files, um, and are also auto tagging rules can be found. We will come back to the, the top three in a minute, but because I brought up auto asset tagging, let's start there. Auto asset tagging will run as soon as the responder is installed on an asset. And some of you probably picked up that I'm talking about something called a responder. This is how, this is actually what we refer to, uh, call um, 
the what was previously known as an agent within air because we decided that our agent is actually uh, not an agent it's not a traditional agent it's not monitoring it's not detecting it's not doing any, any of those sort of hefty things that you normally associate with an agent it's actually just waiting to receive instructions from the console and then it responds to those instructions when they arrive so that's why you'll hear me talking about responder and responder once it lands on an asset um, and it's uh, connected to the console it will report back on whether or not any of the auto asset tag rules have been identified on the asset that it's uh, installed on so this is really handy so straight out of the box and from from the get-go you're in a position where some of your assets could well be tagged um, and let's take a look right down at the bottom because towards the bottom of any list that you come across in air towards the start you will see the the uh, items that come out of the box with the platform so down at the bottom here you can see the very first one in my list here is domain controller iis web server web server mail server etc as you work up the list so these are all um, out of the box auto asset tags so when the responder is up it will identify if the asset that it's running on is performing the job of a web server for instance um, as i scroll further up the top of the list you'll start to see some of the user generated auto asset tags um, and this is really helpful because you can actually almost consider this your first triage or threat hunt that you can go prepared to a particular incident with you could have established a tag already so that as soon as the responder is running it scans for the ones that come out of the box but it also scans for one that you've identified because you know that you're going to a scene where for instance let's say you're looking for this executable here can you see i have uh, something called one two three xe here uh, this is obviously a, a um, generated by a user if i select it now we can actually see what it's doing so up here with the tag name is 123.exe detected. So this is what will appear if the condition below is identified on the asset on which responder is running. So it's all it's looking for here is to see if a particular process called uh, 123.exe is running on that asset. If it is, it will report it and tag it as uh, this particular tag here. There are many other ways in which when you're making your own auto asset tags, you can do this. You can look for directories, uh, you can look for files, you can look for host names, IP addresses, um, and you can make a custom OS query. So if we go back and look at perhaps one that's a little bit more, um, let's look at one of the ones that come out of the box. So you can see, for instance, what do we look for when we're saying we're hunting for a mail server? Well, there are three conditions associated with the mail server. So there's the tag name, mail server. And then what we're looking for here is whether or not this file exists, this setup.log file. We're looking to see if this directory exists. And there you can see the path to the directory and then another directory. And if you notice all of these come over to the right hand side here, all of these are, all three of these have the or switch applied to them so then they're, they're not and switches they're all switches so if any one of those conditions exist the asset that the responder is running on will be tagged as a mail server for those of you who want to get a bit more detailed and and and, and really start to reap the benefits of this um i think really neat feature if we look at this example here where someone's looking for uh, and bear in mind, please, it's a, it's a training exercise, so it's not designed to be anything other than that. But you can see that someone here has created, in fact, I think it was me, created a Mimi Cats 2 training tag. So what we, what we have here is someone looking for, um, in the first instance, an OS query here where the description is like Mimi Cats, and they're looking at, for that in the at compact shims. Okay, and then the, here's another one of those or switches. So we've got another custom OS query here, and we're looking for a file name called Mimi Cats in the prefetch. So this is this is super powerful. What you can do, it's very very flexible. Um, and then there's a couple of more simple ones here. 
another all switch if the process mimicats.exe is running and finally one more all switch looking for the existence of this directory and the wildcards here the double wildcard are indicating in any directory i'm looking for a directory called mimicats underscore trunk so if any one of those conditions because they're all on this all switch exist that asset will be marked as uh, Mimi Cats 2 training. So <clears throat> I think you can see that there's some real benefits in uh, using auto asset tagging. Let's come back to um, our assets. And we were looking down our list here and we were talking about the tags and we were explaining how these tags could arise. And so when I scan this list, I can actually see that all of these are um, user generated tags. None of these have been activated by the out of the box auto asset tagging um, because we don't recognize any of those names as being as such. And then finally at the bottom of the secondary menu here, there's some other filters that may well help you quickly get to um, resolve some of those problems that perhaps you saw on the dashboard. For instance, I've got two machines isolated. Uh, I may have some sort of performance indicator that doesn't let me have more than one machine isolated. So I have to, if I select that, those two machines that are currently isolated will be uh, filtered out and I can work on these two, try and understand why they remain isolated. And for instance, if I was to take a look at Henry Stanley here, um, I can drill into it a little bit more and work out as to why that might be isolated or not and uh, change the condition of it if, if necessary. <clears throat> So coming back to um, our assets page, I have uh, 24 assets in this particular um, organization. One of the first things my, my, I might need to do is add a new asset to my organization. Perhaps I've got a new employee, perhaps um, a new device has come online at one of my remote offices. And the way in which I would look to add that is by coming to the action button. Always on a page next to the page title, which in this case is assets, you will see a, an action button. So a, a call to action for what we can do on that page. If I select this, there are four things that we can do in respect of adding a new asset. So the first one is deploy new, then we can deploy to the, a cloud account. We can um, generate an off network collection package, or here's that new one that we spoke about briefly. We can actually uh, bring a disk image um, into air as, a, as an asset. So uh, we can take that raw file and bring it in as, a, as, a, as an asset. So let's have a look at how we would go about doing that. And the first thing is to look at this one, which is probably where we're going to spend most of our time as investigators uh, when we're adding new assets is to um, look at adding assets that are reachable on our network. The first thing we're inviting you to consider as to whether or not you need or want to make use of a, um, a relay server connection. The default is not. The default um, encourages you to make a direct correction to the console. There's no, um, there's no benefit to this and as much as there's no speed performance um, noticeable around whether or not you connect directly or use the relay server, but your IT infrastructure um, particularly sort of uh, in the banking sector or um, in, in very secure environments where they want to uh, run all of their traffic through one relay server, this gives you the ability to do this. And that relay server can exist outside of your firewall or inside your firewall, depending on, on your requirements. But as I say, we, we encourage, uh, or by default, we say go for a direct connection. So I'll stick with that. Tim, may I, may I jump in and just uh, point something out about the relay server really quickly that is often That's misunderstood good. that is, is probably good to ex explain. And that is that those relay servers are organization specific. So if you're working in one organization, then that organization can, can utilize that relay server. Uh, if you want some more information on that, feel free to reach out to us, but they are per organization. Great point. Thanks, Craig. So, we're looking to deploy new, um, and that's brought us to this the deployment page, um, which those of you who've been with us for, for 18 months or even shorter than that will have noticed it's growing. The number of supported operating systems continues to grow, um, and uh, we add them here so that this is uh, everything that you can deploy to is shown here. 
important thing to point out perhaps is that this is i'm talking to you from a, a mac right now so it's identified the operating system i'm i'm running on which is why it's defaulted to uh, the mac os option here but if i just bring it back to windows uh, let's start like uh, reading from left to right with this selected you can now see the variety of ways in which you can deploy the agent um, so circumstances are different for for everyone um, and sometimes people have um, predetermined routes for installation other times they don't and uh, those are the times when they might come here and they think oh actually which one of these can will work best for me so let's take a look uh, the first thing that we have on the left hand side here is the um, ability to download an NSI package. So you can see when I click the drop down arrow, I get the choice, uh, two flavors of processor that I can choose from. And I can, if I'm not unsure, I can just hover over this uh, supported versions tooltip here to give me an idea of make sure that the uh, device that I'm looking to put the agent stroke responder onto is supported. Um, I can see it's in the list there. I could also, if I wanted to make a um, copy this PowerShell command simply by copying, clicking on it right now, that'll generate a copy. I can take that PowerShell command and run that on the asset or indeed a PowerShell script. Script. Those of you running Active Directory or SCCM methodologies, you can definitely make use of this. And this is one of the most popular methods uh, for our bigger customers with, uh, who have that environment. Uh, this is the, perhaps the most simple uh, way for them to operate. The other thing that's changed, I'm sure this has changed for many of you. If you've, if you've been with us for more than six months now, you'll notice that our off-network task uh, package generation is now part of uh, this workflow rather than having a separate one. So if ever I need to deploy to a Windows device that is off-network, I can do that from here and I can generate an acquisition package or I can generate a triage package from this location, from our um, deploy new page. One of the really popular ways of, of getting, the, uh, getting the responder out onto um, assets is this, is to come down here on the, uh, and copy the share link. This, uh, this share link deploys all that is needed by the end user um, to go ahead and install the uh, responder on an asset. So perhaps I've got a new starter and I need them to put the uh, responder onto their system, or I've got an investigator at or near the machine that they need to be investigating. All I need to do is get this uh, shareable deployment link to them. So for instance, let's have a look at how that would work. If I, if I hit copy here and I open up a brand new page, imagine I've opened this up on the, on the actual target machine. All I need to do is paste this uh, link into here, hit enter. And what will appear will be a, a sort of a cut down version of what we were looking at there. So immediately with uh, zero further uh, configuration on the part of the user, I now have access to the deployment um, capabilities of air on the actual asset that I'm working on. And again, it's, it's detected the operating system that we're running on. So from here, I could simply go ahead and install the, the package file from here, or I could run a curl command or a wget command from here um, if I wanted to. And then within two or three minutes, the uh, responder is up and running. It's reported back to the console says, saying I'm here and you get the little green icon, meaning there's a good connection. And don't forget any of my auto asset tags that I've been, um, that were part of my installation package they will be identified already. So um, they will be highlighted as tags on that device for me immediately. So we support Windows, we support Linux, two flavors of Linux here, very similar methodology as you see, you, you can work through the methodologies here. Some of these um, are super easy. All you have to do is copy these commands here um, and the installation will be made for, will, will go ahead for you. Um, exactly the same as we do Apple. Chrome, you'll notice that over in the top right-hand side here, that this is a standalone collector. So again, you're gonna be able to collect from Chrome um, uh, using the standalone collection capability, as is the case with um, ESXi systems. 
which by the way, in, in the release that just came out, I think it's come out today, I'm not sure if it did make it in the end, um, we've increased the number of supported artifacts from 10 or 12 up to just under 100 or just on 100, I think, um, artifacts that we can now collect from ESXi systems, which is super useful if you have to investigate one of those. And then IBM AIX, again, this is available as an off-network task. Um, these are for those machines, particularly associated quite often with financial um, uh, organizations and such like. So that's how we would uh, that's how we would deploy using the uh, using the first option that we saw from the action button here under the deploy new cloud accounts very straightforward also currently we support AWS and Azure um, Google Cloud Platform is coming soon this has been in a coming soon state for a while but that this is uh, hopefully around the corner for us. Um, but again, very simple here. Let's just pick one of these. If we if if we knew we were going to a um, deploying on for an organization that was based in the uh, Microsoft Azure cloud, I'd simply come and click on Add Account, um, and the wizard. Everything, by the way, everything in in Air is generally or nearly always wizard driven. So it's very easy not to make a mistake or forget something. So. We're straight away opening up a, a wizard here, which you as the uh, owner of this Azure account would know your account name and you should know your client ID, your subscription ID, tenant ID, and of course your secret key. If you do know those details, then simply all you have to do is go ahead and uh, fill them in and you can start to deploy the responder to the Amazon Azure cloud and automatically uh, the system will enumerate the machines that you have there. And again, they will start to ping up on your list of assets. If we scroll down here, I'm not sure if I've got any um, cloud-based assets. I'm not seeing any jump out at me at the moment. Uh, no, but as you can see, you would expect down here underneath the platform, you'd get an indication. Um, oh, here we go. Sorry, I was being blind. Here's, here's one here based in Azure, it's actually off network at the moment, but you can see that this is a cloud-based Azure asset, as is this one down at the bottom here. So where were we? So off network packages, um, this, is, this is very neat. What this means is, uh, and, and I'm quite sure for those of you who respond to incidents quite often when you get there or you're called to deal with something, um, the, the device that you're interested in investigating has been pulled from the network. So it's um, it's off network. You cannot get to it remotely. It's uh, physically been disconnected potentially. Um, so one of the things you might want to do rather than plugging it back in and putting it back online and deploying remotely, one of the things, one of the options that's available to you is to go ahead and acquire um, using our off network collection package. And you would use this window to do that. And in fact, let's go ahead and let's take this opportunity because I sort of see we're already over half an hour into this. We need to make progress. Let's go ahead and use this as the example of making an acquisition. A lot of the, a lot of the process and the, the um, methodology we we'll use to do an off-network package applies to your normal collection packages as well, evidence collection. So let's hit acquire. The first thing we're being invited to do, again, all wizard driven, is to choose the assets that we're going to be working on. And in this case, we know we're working in the off-network environment, so the radio button for off-network has automatically been selected for us. And we have a whole host of different types of operating system based on their processor types here. So if I knew 100% I was only going to be going for uh, Windows 64-bit systems, then I could take make my pack, the collection package really small. I mean, even if I select all of them, it's still fairly small. But if I just wanted to go with something that's about 20 megabits in size, I would hit this 64-bit collection, and that will give me all I need to carry out uh, evidence acquisition from a 64-bit Windows machine. If, on the other hand, you have no idea what you're going to, then you may as well select all of them. Uh, and generate a package that when you arrive at the scene, you know that you've got everything that is possible for you to have in respect of uh, the, the systems that are supported by air. So with everything selected, 
Now come down to the bottom right hand corner, I would select next. That takes us to step two in the wizard you can see here, and this is the setup stage of uh, designing this package. This is where I would give, um, uh, give this a meaningful name. And of course, I never do because we're just demoing. So if I just call this Tim Test here, and then I'm going to choose an acquisition profile. And this, <clears throat> this is where uh, we're going to probably spend the next 10, maybe seven or 10 minutes talking about acquisition profiles, because this is one of the drivers behind getting speed and accuracy into your uh, working processes. And a lot of what we do around collecting evidence is based on acquisition profiles. And if you get this right, um, this is where you can make some fantastic savings. So if I click on the acquisition profile, as we said before, at the very top, I'm gonna to see an awful lot of, there's Craig, one of Craig's at the top there, I'm gonna see an awful lot of uh, user generated profiles at the top. If I scroll all the way to the bottom, I'll start to see the out of the box options. Um, and for instance, nearly always when I'm um, exploring this or working with this or advising people on how best to use this, if they're going into a situation where they really need that very quick um, assessment of the, the actual assets that they're looking on, this is quite a nice one. This is a compromise assessment acquisition profile. And I can select that as the profile that I, I would like to use just to give me that first look um, at the assets I'm interested in. So remember, this could be a report on one asset. It could be a report on a thousand. It could be a report on 10,000 assets. Um, th but this is the way in which I would probably look to start my investigation. And then I can always escalate up from this level of um, assessment. So what does that actually look like? So rather than just selecting this blindly, because I, if this is the first time I've done this, I don't really know what's involved in a compromise assessment. What I could do is I could come down here and click a new profile. So I would do this for two reasons. One, to check what's in the profile I'm using, or two, to make a brand new one myself. So if I wanted to add a new profile, I would come here and you can see, if I just minimize this, you can see that this is how we split these out um, into different groups for better understanding. So when I'm writing a new acquisition profile, I would give it a name. I would then decide whether I'm going to make it available to all organizations within my uh, installation, or am I going to just narrow it down to this one organization so that I don't want anyone, anyone else to have access or use of this particular um, profile. Potentially in an organization, that's going to be the case if you think that this is so bespoke to my organization, there's no point anyone else having it. So I may as well make it just available to this particular organization. So this is how I would go and make a new acquisition profile from the position I'm in. But if you remember, if, I, if actually what I wanted to do was to go, um, let's close out of this, is to go and check my uh, acquisition profiles and what does a compromise assessment acquisition profile currently give me. I go back to my libraries where we were for auto asset tagging. And if I click on the acquisition profile list, here I can see that full list. Um, I can see down here in the bottom right that there are currently 42 um, profiles available to me in this organization. And if I scroll to the bottom like we were doing um, a moment ago, there, there is the list of the out of the box one. And here is that compromise assessment profile. So when I select this profile, that, now what I'll see over here on the right hand side is, uh, is the profile itself. So it has a name here already because it's, it is the compromise assessment profile. It is available for all organizations. And so now when I look at the, the boxes, you'll see they're all the same. They're based on operating system or this e-discovery option at the bottom. But if I look at the Windows collection, if I expand this here, I can start to see the thinking here. I can start to understand why the binalized threat hunting engineers have come up with this combination of artifacts that they think you should collect as part of a compromise assessment profile. And when you scroll down, you can see we've got crash dumps. You can see we've got any antivirus information, proxy lists, installed applications, firewalls, 
fire, firewall rules, USB storage, you see all really useful stuff. And as we keep scrolling through, you can start to see, and maybe some of you have spotted it already, that the big stuff is not included here. Some of the, the beefy items that we will collect potentially in a normal investigation where we wanted to um, look at the RAM, for instance, the page file, a hibernation file, these are all big files, but they're not really necessary in that initial triage, that initial um, asset compromise assessment of the asset. Um, we're focusing on the meaningful files. So the MFT as a CSV, for instance, this is a good example. So rather than taking this option below and dumping the whole contents of the MFT, we're focusing on something a little bit quicker for us. We're going to get an MFT copy, but made human readable as a CSV file. Um, some registry information. So we're pulling the useful bits from the registry, things like a type URLs, application paths. We're going to pull some network information, network adapters that will be used, and a DNS cache, of course, things that are quick to collect. Here's another really good example of something that would take a long time potentially to collect. If we're going after all of the EVT or EVTX files, uh, we don't. We have a, an algorithm that collects the most recent event records. So what do we mean by that? This works on a, a record by record basis. And we will go back in the region of 2,600 entries per record. So what that means is um, we're not going after stuff that might be five years old. We're going after stuff relevant to more likely to be relevant to your investigation and analyzing that for you. And you can see that um, lots of other um, artifacts are included in this. But the purpose of this is to give you a compromise assessment profile and to give you a profile that's going to return a result in, in maybe seven or eight minutes, something like that. Um, and that's not just the collection, that's, uh, sorry, I'm going to give you seven or eight minutes for collection, and then there's going to be some, uh, if you decide to go with the post acquisition analysis as well, that's going to, where we're going to be running our drone analyzers across this. This is going to be the best way of getting an early heads up as to whether or not there's an issue with the device, uh, with the actual um, machine that you're interested in. So let's imagine we're doing that in the, in the real world here, and we're going to, um, assets um, and let's pick one of our machines here imagine there's a um, we've had a an alert or we've had some information that there's a problem with this machine here so jack white if i select jack white as a as an asset i'm looking at the asset info page to the right of the aso info asset info title is the asset actions page so if i select that here are all of the things i can do to that uh, particular asset. So if I wanted to acquire evidence, I would do exactly what we were doing before. So this time we'll follow it through a bit more. We're gonna go Tim T is my task name. Now I'm being invited to allocate this to a case. Now this is, this is very important if you want to um, make or take all the benefit that you can from our investigation hub. If you allocate something to a case, it will all be, um, uh, what's the word I was, I'm staggering for around for, but it will all be added to the same case and can be uh, used in our investigation hub to present you with everything that you've done in a particular case. Um, and this is the real power because the investigation hub will deliver to you all of the verdict scores and findings associated with a particular case. So if I scroll down my lists, um, you can see I have a list of all of the cases. Um, this is one of my regular ones. If I go to this case that's called day one, I can decide whether or not I want to run this uh, acquisition right now or I can schedule it for later. Uh, we'll come back to scheduling of tasks because this is, this is a really useful feature. It's brand new uh, in the way in which it works with the release that's come out today. Um, and I'll, I'll hopefully I'll have time to show you that after we've gone through this. But imagine um, I want to run this uh, particular evidence acquisition right now. <clears throat> I'm coming to my list. I'm scrolling down the bottom because I know my compromise assessment. Uh, I know what's in there now because I've explored it and I'm happy with the content. 
So I'm going to accept that as my option. I want to run a compromise assessment right now on this individual asset. If I select to the next stage, um, which is called customization, this is where I can choose to um, use the policies that have been set up in my organization. So this is the best option normally if you're wanting to keep everything uh, um, to follow the same rule set. Or if you don't want to do that, if you want to make some adjustments to um, the customizational options, you can do that by selecting the, the bottom radio button. And you can see that this is where you can control things like where do you want the evidence to go? So in my case, it's currently set to be stored on the local um, asset. If I wanted to change it to go to a um, off network evidence repository, I do that. I just change the radio button. And then if I want to select the evidence repository, I come to the next box because I could have multiple as, as you can see in this case. And then if we don't see the evidence repository that we want to use, we simply click on add new repository here. Let's take a very quick look at this. You can see, I don't know whether you remember that graphic we had right back at the beginning. It showed that the, um, the available repositories that we support with AIR are SM, uh, SMB, SFTP, FTPS, Amazon, and Azure. And whenever you change to one of these options, again, the boxes that you're required to fill out, um, the wizard presents them to you so that you can bring in a new evidence repository if you haven't already um, set one up beforehand. Hopefully this is normally a one-time deal. Once you've set up your repository, you're going to be happy uh, with it. And you can see, imagine I was quite happy to send all of my collections to this, uh, uh, let's say, this UK network share. I then decide um, whether I want to use a temporary uh, location for my evidence. I can do that here, or I can switch on a direct collection. So if I switch on direct collection, this means that um, I'm going to minimize the amount of local disk space I use, and my collection is going to be going direct to my evidence repository. The default location, by the way, on your local machine um, will be chosen based on the actual uh, um, size available to the volume that's going to be used. So you can see I have the automatically select volumes button select here. I turn that off, then I'll manually select it. Um, and you can see when it's when it's set to um, not be automatic, the default directory is C uh, slash finalize air temp. I, this is also where I would choose whether or not I want to throttle my CPU demands. So the responder is actually really um, makes very low demands on the actual asset. And very few customers tend to tinker with this unless they know that they're going to be doing some big triages or um, uh, they're going to be running some scans on the asset that's that may have a slight impact on the performance and the, the user themselves um, may notice that but generally speaking you don't have to tinker with this too much uh, and for a compromise assessment bearing in mind this is only going to take five or seven minutes um, it's it's not really worth messing with this same with bandwidth we give you the ability to uh, throttle the bandwidth so if you were worried if you had bandwidth issues you could actually um, uh, have, you've got some control over that right here. Um, and what else should we mention here? So and also the ability to um, compress evidence or encrypt evidence is given to you right here. Um, obviously, compression is good because it re re reduces the amount of disk space, but it does add a little bit of time to the way in which uh, the acquisition of your evidence might take place before it's available to you. Encryption, the, the traffic itself is, of course, encrypted, uh, TLS2. Um, and the um, evidence, if you wanted it encrypted when it arrives at its destination, so if you wanted an additional password protecting that zip container, this is where you could enforce that. But bear in mind, everything we've been talking about here is because we're customizing these options. You don't have to do this every time because most of the time, you should be running, or you probably prefer to be running, using the policies set up for your organization. So the analysts themselves don't have to think about this at all. Um, we've spent five minutes talking about it, but the reality is this is a button that they're just going to click straight through to next on.
Um, so a quick question for you about the, an, an acquisition. You talked a little bit about um, off network or air gapped collections earlier. Is it necessary to encrypt off network collections from assets? Um, is it necessary? That's a good question, Craig. I'm not sure. Um, when they arrive on the asset, they will already be encrypted. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't. I would say that that step is not going to be necessary. I don't know. Throw some light on this. It's a. I feel yeah. like the question is coming from you. It's going to be a winger. It, it well, it's coming from a bit of experience. You've noticed that option at the bottom to encrypt. You, there's no need to actually check that box when you're doing an off-network collection because your hmm. your off-network collectors will automatically be encrypted, and there's not a need to do it twice. the The way to decrypt it would be to pull it back in, and of course, if we have time, we'll cover that. I just thought there is a difference in that one feature that I wanted to quickly point out. Yeah, no, that that is a good point and a valid point. And and of course, you know, um, uh, when the engineers designed this, they obviously designed it with that in mind. We have a lot of customers who use our off-network collectors, and there there are. Um, it's kind of interesting to understand sometimes the way in which the thinking goes on. For instance, in Japan, um, we have a, an organization there which really doesn't like to use agents it's a it, agents aren't very popular in japan and even though ours is not technically an agent it's a responder um they still prefer to use uh, off network collection methodologies um and of course it makes so much sense that the collection itself if it's going to a thumb drive or to some other third party storage location it remains encrypted so yeah great point craig thanks you, you also briefly made mention of the fact when you started this process that you might have received an alert. Where where might you have received an alert in order to kick off this collection? Is that Can that be automated in, in this platform? Yeah, sure. Um, hopefully, we've got time to cover this a bit later. But uh, so you can see down the left-hand side in the main menu here, I'm guessing this is a, a customer question. We've got integrations here. And one of the things we're we're very active with is making sure that we do integrate with existing uh, alert systems or secure cybersecurity systems. So um, I'm hoping I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and uh, yes, so the, the the beauty of that system is that any one of those alerts can force Air to spring into action and to go ahead and create a collection based on the profiles that you've already predetermined. Let me, am I okay to carry on, Craig, or did you want yeah, me to absolutely. go down that? Route? Yeah, absolutely. No. Okay. Um, so in our evidence acquisition profile, the third step was this customization. And as, as we were saying, this is something that you will not need to spend the time on it that we have, but um, we, we covered the detail of it. And then so we come to next, and the final step is to choose uh, what we're calling here the follow-up. So what do we want to do um, following on from our acquisition of this evidence? And the, the, key, the key thing here is uh, analysis. Um, and we have something called Drone. Drone is our um, post-acquisition um, an analysis capability. And in this particular case, you can see by default this is toggled on. And really, we should leave this on because this is where a lot of the, uh, the magic and the uh, the, the, the um, years of uh, engineering research etc uh, kick in and this is where you get those benefits um, of things being highlighted that are not quite right uh, things that are running in suspicious locations are being highlighted any mitre attack uh, items that we can highlight where there's been some uh, conflict with one of the mitre attack uh, tactics or procedures will be highlighted for you if you notice when i turn this off at the top level everything goes so this takes this means that you're not doing any analysis on what you've collected, which, of course, is a valid case because you may well not want to do any analysis on the items that you've collected. Um, you might just need them collected for whatever purpose. But if we leave this on, you can see it gives you the ability to add a keyword. So you can bring in a keyword list or you can individually type keywords in. So when that evidence is acquired, we will check it for any keywords that you want to search. Um, you can use wildcards in here. You can use regular expression. Um, 
underneath there you you have mitre attack this is really one of the uh, linchpins of our drone analysis capability everything we do with our analyzers is linked to the mitre attack um, mapping system again you can turn this off um, and you can do that simply by toggling the switch as i just did there again i would recommend not doing that the the impact on the actual asset because this these rules are being run on the asset itself um, and we are scanning in the processes for instance and looking for things um, CVEs that are very up to date and recent. You can see when I hover over this little green um, up to date uh, notification here, it's telling me that this was checked within the last two or two hours ago. Um, and normally this is never more than two hours out of date. So this is great because we have a, a really um, aggressive uh, DFIR threat hunting lab who are constantly publishing new rules um responding to what they're seeing out there um you know in in the wild on the dark web and such like and they're putting you in a, a really strong position that you know that the rule sets we're applying are going to be very up to date below the mitre attack itself are the uh, are the binalized scanners you can see there's some 20 or so here individual scanners ranging from web shell analysis to um, network share and analysis shell bags analyzers all of these are individually controllable. Uh, again, you know, if you didn't want the ransomware identifier uh, active, you could turn it off here. And the best way I can sum up what's going on here, if we haven't, if you haven't heard this analogy before, is that what we do with these analysis pipelines is we get in each individual artifact or piece of information, and it gets pushed down an analysis pipe. And as soon as it hits one of the triggers in the analysis pipeline, it is thrown out of the pipeline and marked with that score. And obviously the higher up uh, the pipeline it gets thrown out, the higher the score is. Um, and that's why you start to see things uh, that are flagging up as red and dangerous, or if it's gone far further down the pipeline, they'll be coming out as um, uh, suspicious and they'll be marked as orange, that sort of color there. So it's a color coded system that's based on uh, at what point in a pipeline um, the, the analyzer is being, being triggered. And so when we're ready to go, we would just simply hit start task. And that's, that's off and running right now. Uh, that task is off and running. If I wanted to have a look at it, if I come over to my uh, the secondary menu here underneath the asset, because we're only dealing with one asset here, if I click on tasks, um, let's just get rid of this. I can see that here, that here is that task that I started. It's called Tim T um, and it's marked as assigned and that's off and running. So we'll see, we'll see what's going on there. Um, quite interesting below, by the way, look, it's interesting to see someone has uh, started to image this device. So this might take a little bit longer than, um, than I would normally expect because uh, we have actually got someone uh, on this same case right now, taking an image of, of this particular device. Um, okay, so we were looking at some of the things we could do. And one of the things I did want to point out, and I know time is marching on, um, is, is the ability to schedule um, uh, tasks now. Um, and this is new, this is hot off the press just today. Um, so if we come back to our assets, um, and if I was, say, interested in running a scheduled task on a number of my assets, so if I select, say, just these top three or four um, for the sake of this example, what you'll notice is that this blue bar at the bottom sprung to life then, and this is what we call our bulk action bar. Again, a fairly, a fairly, new, uh, a fairly new feature, and this will, this will, um, this will uh, identify the number of assets that you've got highlighted and ready for working on so even if i just select say uh, let's select this one and um, this one here a mac one i can see i've now got two assets selected and here are the things that i can do to those two assets so i can acquire an image um, i can i can acquire evidence if i wanted to let's just for the purpose of trying to speed things up and not do another acquire evidence. Let's go acquire image in this particular case. 
just because we're using this to um, demonstrate the schedule acquisition. I can see that assets have been selected and there are two of them. So that's confirming um, what I've, uh, what I already know. Um, I should give this, I could give this a meaningful um, name as, as normal. Schedule, I'm going to call it Schedule 1. And then I can allocate this to a case. So this is kind of neat that I can still, even though I'm, this is a scheduled acquisition, I can still send it to uh, a case. Now, rather than choosing to do this right now, I can schedule later. Um, so what I would do is pick schedule for later and that opens up some new options here. So the first thing I'm invited to do is to select the time zone that I want to kick off my scheduled acquisition. Then I can choose the date and time to start that. And I've got a, a picker here to pick, say I want it to start uh, tomorrow, which is Friday at 1500. Um, and I'm quite happy to do that 1500 UTC. So I'll leave that where it is right now. Then I've got the option to repeat the task. Um, this is this option, as you can see, this is quite a good example, a good way of showing you where you might get some guidance around things that are not possible. So by hovering over the repeat uh, toggle switch in this case, what you'll notice is that it's telling me that this uh, reoccurring action is not available when I'm allocating it to a case. And this is because of the complications associated with um, uh, actually having a reoccurring um, collection that's going to a case that's been is no longer available. So that's why this is in, in place like that. So what I could do is rather than um, allocating it to a place, let's just go back and let's go forward again. This time not, let's just get rid of this here if I can make this. Ah, now this was a slight problem the other day. So what I'm gonna need to do what I want to do, just so you can see, is I want to select nothing here, and I don't think it's going to let me select nothing. So what we'll do, just for the purpose of getting this right, is we'll leave this, and I will start again with acquire image. This time, I'm going to leave this blank, and I'm not going to allocate it to a case, and I'm going to go schedule for later. Now, when I turn on the repeat, I get the ability to repeat the acquisition. Um, uh, well, this is not an acquisition, this is an image uh, acquisition. Um, and I can choose to do that on a daily, weekly or monthly basis. And then I can choose to repeat that um, every number of days. So when do I want to do this? Daily, every three days. Daily, every four days. So I, I get some control over that. And then imagine I wanted to do it, say, weekly, I, exactly the same thing. I could choose to repeat this every fourth week on a Tuesday. So very granular controls here. The next thing you need to consider is, you know, there's, you need to think about an end time for this. So at the moment, this is on never, um, have never end. So this will continue forever. Or I can choose to end this on a particular date and time. Or I can choose to end this after a particular number of occurrences. The choice, the choice is yours. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> It's worth mentioning here that at the moment I'm uh, looking to acquire volumes and I can see uh, what volumes are available to me to acquire. Or if I wanted to acquire physical disk, I can go for a physical disk um, by doing that. And I can see here's the physical disk that's available to me right now. Um, and then next comes my customization, although I haven't chosen a, a physical disk yet. So if I chose, uh, I'm going to go back actually and choose a volume, choose this volume. Um, yeah, okay, so I've chosen a disk. Let's take that off, go back to my volume, go next. And then because we're doing some imaging now, we can choose where we want to send this. Because it's imaging, it's going to be to an evidence repository. It's not possible to send this to the local machine. I can choose to um, acquire this in chunks, or I can turn this toggle switch on here and make it a single zip file. Worth noting that we do need a single zip file if you are going to be using the add uh, disk image to your assets within air, it needs to be in a single raw image. So um, you wouldn't be able to add it if you've chunked it up. So best to select the 
single zip file option if you're going to be thinking about bringing this image that we're acquiring back into air for uh, analysis and then there's the other here are some images of we're acquiring bank into air and the, thanks siri uh, and then um, then we got those options around uh, the bandwidth limitation and the compression limitation so that's how we would that's how we would schedule a task so i'm going to leave that right now how are we doing any questions craig uh, we've answered a question about drone being related to the evidence being acquired, but other than that, you're good to go. Brilliant. So let's jump straight on a bit um, because I did want to spend, we've only got sort of uh, 20 minutes left. I did want to take a look at the the end result of what we what we're talking about here. the the we've run our acquisition. we've we've um, we've applied drone to a particular task. Um, and we spoke briefly about the investigation hub. And you can see down here in the list of cases that I have in uh, compromised.org, we have uh, a case called day one. If I select that case, do you remember this is the one we were sending bits and pieces to as we've gone through today's demo. If I look at um, the day one case, I can see here are the assets associated with my, my day one investigation. And again, I get a breakdown in the secondary menu of those um, those activities. And you can see that because uh, because we've hammered this one over the last few weeks or months, uh, this particular case, you can see there's a lot of tasks in here. A lot of acquisitions have gone into this. Um, and you can break down and look at these individually if you wanted to. Look at those 90 triages, which we haven't spoken about triage yet today. But we can look at those triages. Um, or what we could do is come right down to the bottom and select the investigation hub. And so what the investigation hub will do, it will present all of this information that's listed above here in a single pane of glass. And um, it will do that on the fly. Um, what I mean by that is it, this is not a flat file or a file that's been prepared already. If I hit investigation hub right now, what's happening is Air is actually looking at all of those reports and it's building this report from the position it is in right now um, as I'm speaking to you. So you can see it's gonna take a moment or two because there's a lot of information here. And if I look at the little, I'm not sure you call that a pie chart, but the thing in the middle here, this nice graphic that gives us an overall view of what's going on here. You can see that um, AIR is building this report based on 198 um, triages or acquisitions out of a possible 199. So there is one thing still pending to be added to this case so it's still ongoing um, perhaps it's an acquisition or the imaging task uh, it won't be the imaging task but it could be something else that we're pending for this so that's quite useful you know if you see that there's 20 or 30 missing from here you know that you need to wait before you're getting the complete picture across all of the triages or acquisitions that you set off running the other thing that was really nice to highlight at this point is that over on the right hand side is, in fact, look at that. We've just got one here has come in right now. So that is going to be the, the task that you and I did together uh, a moment ago. The green bar at the top is indicating that we've got one more report. And you can see the count has increased to 200 and we're only looking at 189. So if I hit reload now here in the top right, what will happen is that the, the, the report will be reloaded. Didn't sound like a, a good use of the English language there. Let's hit that again. Okay, it should reload. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jog it along a bit because time time's important to us right now. I'm going to hit the refresh button rather than the reload button. Um, and so now we should see uh, we should see that added. Let's, uh, as it pulls itself together, 198 out of 200. I'm kind of like thinking it should come to 199 out of 200. Um, let's give it a chance, and I'll carry on talking anyway, and we'll see what happens there. Um, so yeah, over here on the right-hand side, this top asset breakdown can be very useful and informative to investigators because what's happened here is based on some of the um, um, verdicts or the findings, I should say, based on the findings, we're putting up here the three assets that are, if you like, the worst affected by 
issues, worse affected by issues that, um, I think we broke it briefly. It's just a refresh based on um, our findings. So whether they're dangerous, matched, uh, matched by the way is with a keyword hit. So can you see here the orange, when it says matched, there's 1,197 items here, which are uh, matched with keywords, suspicious, rare. And then we've got our uh, um, scores here around relevant high, uh, high, medium and low. So these three assets are the ones perhaps where we should focus our initial attention on. So let's just, for clarity, just explain where we are in the primary menu or where the primary menu would be normally. Over here on the left-hand side, we can see the assets that we're considering in our investigation. So if I wanted to remove one of these from the investigation, because I'm happy that it's uh, not no longer a factor, I could just remove the tick, hit apply, and that particular asset will now be removed from the investigation. Um, and you can see uh, that that's some of the information associated that has been taken out. So if I was to go down, and remove another one, this one here, hit apply, um, and I can actually reduce the amount of assets that I'm, I'm looking at at one particular moment. The next menu over is the list of evidence. So because there is so many items here, as you can see, as I scroll down these items, um, the list is quite compact because we're working on quite a small screen here. But if I was interested in just downloads, for instance, one way of doing uh, furthering my investigation might be to look at each evidence item where there's been uh, items identified as, with findings. So if I select downloads right now, the main viewing area will show me all of the downloads. Um, and at the very top will be the ones that are because we're sorted by the top um, by this column, the finding column, I can see that these are match columns. So these are the, everything in these downloads has come up. And if I hover over it, they've come up as a result of a hit on Mimi Cats as a keyword. So you can see that. And in fact, you can see that it's Mimi Cats is a, appears in the file path name here on, on the right hand side. So this is one way of investigating just to go through those evidence items shown here on the um, under the evidence list. So here are those four relevant um, um, items. And you can see in this particular case, hovering over it, I can see that this has been marked as relevant because this is a crypto mining uh, domain. So this could definitely be worth uh, investigating if, if you found that on some employee's machine. And again, something say for the registry, when we go to the registry, we can see items here. And when we, hire, when we hover over these items, you can see that this one has been marked high because no digital signature was found. It's a rare location. Um, and it happened in a, a what we're calling here a super relevant time period because it was that close to the actual time of the investigation, that the investigation that broke. So um, that's why it's been marked um, as, a, as something of a high significance to us right now. Suspicious, again, um, this one's been identified because it's running with the, in a suspicious path. So as I say, one way of investigating, go through those evidence items. Uh, same with triage. You can see we've got some items with triage hits here. So where we run a Yara triage and we have uh, 22 results under file, we can click that and we can see um, why this has been highlighted. And you can see in this particular case, it's been highlighted because the hash is a match on a Yara rule that we run. And then we can confirm that hash there. One thing you might want to do from here is take that hash somewhere else. Um, if you need this to go to another hash set for another organization, or that you need to search where else in this report that hash exists, you could do exactly that. So this is, this is really comprehensive for all of those assets and all of those acquisitions. If you were to drill down a, a little bit um, uh, to a little bit more focused detail. So imagine you were looking at one tasking assignment applied to one asset. Um, and that's what's going on with this report that I'm looking at right now. So in this particular report here, this is one um, acquisition tasking against one asset. So it's a run on this machine here, Windows 10 slash 002. And you can see that here are all of the items that we've 
um, acquired or attempted to acquire, by the way. So if, if uh, a, an item doesn't exist, an evidence item doesn't exist, it'll still be listed, but you'll see a zero return because you'll always want to know that you did actually go looking for something that wasn't there and have it listed. So when we were looking at all of those assets in our investigation hub, I said go, you could go through the evidence items and look at indi individual flags. Another way of investigating would be perhaps to come here and look at the, all of these will generate filters as you go across the top here. So if I just wanted to see the items marked at high over here, I could just hit this button here and I'll run a filter giving me just the five high items. And when you need to go back to the uh, everything, you just come back to the top left over here and hit the findings button again. And this time, if I wanted to go and look at, say, just the dangerous items, I could do that. But my preferred um, method, as it were, of, of working in the investigation hub, and one that I kind of think people are getting a, a lot of value from and a lot of speed from, is actually to use this MITRE ATT&CK framework because everything we find for you or highlight for you is mapped to a tactic or a technique within the framework. So for instance, in this particular case, if we take a look at initial access um, and, and you can, you, you, on the scale here, you can see the investigation flows along from initial access, execution, persistence. And then once they're on the machine, they're looking to escalate their privileges then once they've escalated privileges, they want to um, uh, hide even more deeply, so defense evasion. Once they've achieved that, potentially credential access is something. So to help escalate privileges, they're going to be dumping um, password files and such like um, credential dumping. And so we go all the way across the framework right up to lateral movement. So once they're in a position to um, jump from the infected machine to, a, to more infected machines, lateral movement is the final part of that jigsaw. But if we go right back to the beginning and I clicked on initial access, I can see that in this particular case, um, you can see that two things have been marked relevant. Uh, this is a nice example because it's the good examples of uh, DFIR, the binalized DFIR lab rule being hit on here. And what they've identified is that um, a password protected zip file has been found on this system. Uh, this is immediately interesting to me because I can see that uh, th this is in the recycle bin as well. So someone has had this password protected zip file and they've now put it in the recycle bin, uh, which sort of makes it doubly interesting. If I extend it out, I can see there's the full name um, that I'm interested in right now. But of course, because it's in the recycle bin, it's been given a file name that starts with a dollar sign. So what could I do from here? Potentially, I'll just to um, look at this, if I scroll up, because my screen's not quite big enough to show you everything in one go. If I scroll up, I can see that this file, um, the file name itself, of course, is not very useful for me to, to uh, go searching for because it, it's, it starts with this dollar R9 E, et cetera. That's not gonna be anywhere else other than connected with the recycle bin. Um, but if I grab this hash value from here, um, and just in this one report, if I was to paste it into our global search, and just before I hit enter, I just want to make sure we've covered off everything in, in our details page here. Yeah, so now I'm going to hit enter. And I'm going to search for that hash value just within this, uh, within this one tasking report. So I've not taken this to the bigger picture. I've not taken this to multiple assets. I've not taken it to a, a triage rule, which I could generate very quickly if I wanted to by going to the quick start button and launching a triage rule. I'm just searching it in the global search option here. And I can see that there are three record entries um, associated with this um, particular hash value. So by going to those records, I can see when I look at the details of one of these three items in the details page over here, this is where very nicely I can see that um, thanks to Microsoft um, Edge, um, one of the features of Edge being that it'll hash files that it downloads, I can see that that hash value is appearing in here and it's associated with um, this particular uh, 
uh, file here. So we can see the file path. We can see that this came into users John's downloads folder. And I can see that the file, its original name was in fact invoice.zip. So this is, this is great. So um, within a minute or two, I've identified that uh, something has been identified as being relevant by a DFIR, a finalized DFIR lab um, as being significant and worthy investigation. I've now established that this password protected zip file that was deleted um, came in originally via Microsoft Edge and was originally called invoice.zip. So we, we, we've gone a long way to, to um, really getting a good idea of what has happened here already. So if we were to put in invoice.zip up here in our global search, I can see, I can start to see more information. I can see that there's a link file associated with that. I can see um, a shell bag entry. So if I look at the browser history, um, let's have a look. No, nothing too interesting there. So I'm going to go a recent documents and we can start to see, here's the recent document information. So I can start to see when this was opened when the link file was generated for it. And so my forensic investigation is, is, is well, well and truly underway um, by drilling down into it like that. If I come back to my findings just quickly, because I, I know we've not got anything like as far as I had hoped in this session. Um, if I come back to the findings here, the next thing I might want to investigate is execution. Or if I stayed where I am right now, when I look down my list of everything, I can start to see there's already some interesting things here. There's a mention of that invoice.exe running in a temporary folder location. And if I hover over, if I kind of look at the dangerous setting here, we can see that that's not, uh, that's not a, a location that I'd expect it to be uh, running in. And I can see that this has been marked as being um, of interest to defense evasion and privilege escalation. Uh, let's take a look at, say, if I just clicked on the item that's marked high for auto runs, for instance, come down to our details box. Uh, you can see that there's more information here um, in respect of that particular um, file. And there I've got another hash value that I'm now going to be interested in searching for. Um, and I can see that why this is interesting is because of this, the actual entry name associated uh, here is, is this weird triple A name. So again, starting to build more and more of a picture up. Maybe I would take that uh, entry name and just search for that in here. That's quite a unique name. So within our report that we're investigating right now, if I just simply put in three A's, hit enter, I can start to see evidence of this. Um, and if I just narrowed it down just simply to drone findings, um, I could start to work my way through individual drone findings in connection with that particular artifact. Um, and if we just scroll through, you can start to see more information where AAA appears. Um, yeah. Funny how sometimes things don't jump out to you. Absolutely. Time flies a bit fast. Hey, yeah, that's how have we got some questions or are you worried that we're running out of time? No, we are good. Uh, we addressed all the questions through the chat. Um, you have uh, a few more minutes if you want to start to sum up. Sum sure. Up. So uh, let's. Um, so we sort of we've looked at a very sort of high level of um, um, acquisitions. We've looked at how we might use the investigation hub. Um, one of the things we haven't spoken about is how we would go about um, tagging items or bookmarking items. You can see in the top right hand corner here, I've got 26 items currently uh, bookmarked in this particular case. If I wanted to add to that, these are the tags here down. You can see them down the left hand side here. So if I wanted to tag these two items where no digital signature has been found, I can do that right here. Uh, and you can see the count has gone up to 28 now. 
if I wanted to focus on that and, uh, and just my uh, bookmarked items, I, when I click on this, I can now see that I have a list of um, the items, uh, the finding items bookmarked. And you can see that this is the breakdown of the different categories of information as to where my bookmarked items uh, are to be found. Um, what I wanted to show, because it's a, it is a new feature here, is if we come back to our console, just refresh my page, uh, we come back to assets. Um, because we spoke about it and touched on it without showing you any detail, just very quickly, our last thing um, I'd like to show you is disk image uh, feature. So if I select the disk image feature here, um, and I go to the SFTP location. What you'll notice is that in this location, I have several disk images available to me right now. If I wanted to add, say, uh, this Windows 10 image, no, this one here, um, I could create the asset simply by clicking on create asset like that right now. So when I look at my um, secondary menu in respect of assets, we can see that there are uh, disk images here and there are four of them available for me to explore. So if I come into the uh, four assets that are being delivered or served up as disk images, if I was interested in this Windows 7 image, if I select it right here, um, what you can see on this screen is that yes, this is an asset, and I can see that the type of asset is disk image. It's telling me that right here. It's a Windows 7 image. Um, and when I come back over to my secondary menu, the way I could actually explore that image is using the, um, this new feature here called File Explorer. If I select File Explorer, the secondary menu now, you can see it's just very quickly scanning the directory tree here. And you can see in the secondary menu, we have a list of um, that uh, hierarchy that's available to us. So if we wanted to drill into this, uh, we could drill down into the folder structure. Um, that's, I don't think there's any documents in here particularly. So just, uh, no, I won't go there. But if we come into say the local folder, application data, nothing there, but we have a breadcrumb trail here as well, by the way. So you can easily go backwards and forwards. Um, within the directory listing um, and you can drill as deep into the actual system as you like. If you select a particular file, um, you know, what impresses me about this more than anything is the speed at which this is happening. Uh, when, when we have a particular file selected, we can look at the metadata associated with the file over here on the right hand side in this viewing pane. We can look at the, we can look at that in text view. So uh, that's could be useful for human readable output. And then also we have this uh, rather nice hex viewer as well. So you can actually get down using our file explorer um, feature. You can go straight down into the, into the, the nitty gritty of, of your investigation. When you select an individual file, like I've done here, you can do two things with it. You can calculate the hash of that file or you can download it. Perhaps you want to uh, download it and view it in its native application um, or download to uh, share with other people. You can do that using um, this feature here. Um, that's uh, using the bulk action bar, as you can see. You've been listening to me for nearly 90 minutes. That's far too long for any sane human being to listen to me. So I'm going to ask for some questions ask Craig to talk. Oh, you've done a great job, Tim. It's been uh, very informative. You've shared a lot of information in a short amount of time. There is, of course, other information we would love to share with you. So feel free to reach out to us if you have questions between Ayelet, myself, and many others on our team. We are here to support you and make sure that you have the information necessary to perform your jobs with Finalize Error. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, everyone.